Good morning to today's webinar about vicarious liability and information gathering. The webinar will be in two parts. In part one we'll discuss vicarious liability and the employer's legal responsibility for acts and omissions of workers. In part two we'll discuss information gathering following a workplace incident. Your presenters today are Brooke Jacobs and Hannah Staunton from Hopgood Gannam. My name is Mike Ironside and I'm your moderator for today. I'm a Customer Services Manager and I look after labour hire. I just want to go th through a couple of housekeeping rules. So how to interact today. Select the audio on the control panel to change between computer audio and the telephone. Please also remember to turn your telephone or microphone on mute to limit any background noise. Click on the red button to hide and unhide the panel. Your comments and questions will appear here throughout the webinar. Feel free to ask questions and we will address them towards the end of the presentation. After the webinar, the recording and presentation will be available on our website in the coming days. If we don't get to all of your questions, we will collect them and publish the answers on our website afterwards as well. There will also be one polling question, we'll ask that after part one. I'd now like to introduce Brooke Jacobs to present part one. Good morning. My name is Brooke Jacobs. I'm a senior associate with Hopgood Gannam. Thank you very much for logging in and participating today. Um, I will be discussing the very difficult topic of vicarious liability, which is the employer's legal responsibility for the acts and omissions of their workers. Just by way of introduction to my presentation, um, I'll take you through the benefit and the burden of being an employer, what is meant by the phrase in the course of employment, the High Court decision in Lepore, the potential liability of employers for the illegal acts of workers if there is sufficient connection with employment and it's done with the apparent authority of the employer, and some principles of vicarious liability that you as employers can take away from today's presentation. When we're dealing with the liability of employers for injury to workers, we're talking about the law of negligence, which is the duty imposed by the law to take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which reasonably foreseeably may injure others, and in this case your workers. The general rule of the law of negligence is that a person is not liable for the wrongdoing of another. However, vicarious liability is an exception to that general rule and has two essential characteristics. Number one, it concerns liability for the negligence or breach of duty of another, and in this case your workers. And number two, it is strict liability or liability without proof of fault on your behalf as the employer. There's been a lot of commentary over vicarious liability over the years. Um, Justice Kirby in the High Court decision in Lepore in the state of New South Wales called vicarious liability a loss distribution device. Fleming in the Law of Torts called it a policy device for fixing liability on a financially solvent defendant. This is the old deep, pocket, deep pockets argument, which basically means the courts will look for a defendant who has the financial capacity to meet the judgment, and often will look for the defendant with the insurer behind it. Why do we have vicarious liability? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from an old principle of law. We know it's old because it's Latin. Respondent superior, which means let the master answer. And this is a principle of law based upon the reciprocity between the benefit and the burden of being an employer doing business for reward. It's an old decision of Ira Bushley and Sons in the United States in which the court said a business enterprise cannot justly disclaim responsibility for accidents which may be fairly said 
to be characteristic of its activities. And importantly for you as employers, vicarious liability is part of the established common law in Australia. It's not found in legislation but in a long line of court authority. Just to give you by way of example a scenario in which vicarious liability of an employer arises, let's assume a, finan a, a factual scenario where an employer operates a metal, metal fabrication business and employs skilled operators. The employer provides induction and training to its workers in the use of a metal press machine. The metal press machine is fitted with guarding in compliance with Australian standards and all relevant safety codes. There are safe work method statements for the operation of the press which are specific to each task. An employed operator decides contrary to his training and all safe work method statements and you would say con contrary to common sense to remove the safety guard on the metal press to make his job go faster. Regrettably, he brings the metal press down on his co-worker who is acting as a spotter and crushes his fingers. In this case, you could say the employer has done everything right and crossed off all of his T's and dotted his I's, however will be found vicariously liable purely for the negligent, negligent actions of the employed operator. So in that way you can see that vicarious liability is just a device for fixing liability on the employer. Um, we were talking about vicarious liability, which is liability for the negligence of workers. Um, an old House of Lords decision um, is probably one of the first authorities to discuss uh, vicarious liability and in that case it was found that if a duty is cast upon a defendant he cannot get rid of it by delegating its performance to a third party. He is at liberty to employ someone to fulfill that duty but remains subject to it and liable for the consequences if it is not fulfilled. So in order for there to be vicarious liability the first thing that must be established is an employment relationship in Hollis and Vabu, the High Court set down a number of tests for determining whether an employment relationship existed. In that case, the defendant employer of Vabu was found vicariously liable for the negligence of a bicycle courier who was an independent contractor for tax purposes. Hollis was an employee for vicarious liability purposes because he wore the uniform of Vabu and worked subject to his direction and supervision and he was found to be an emanation of Babu. In order for the plaintiff to establish that an employer is vicariously liable, they must prove that the employee's wrong was committed in the course of employment. If the employer otherwise expressly authorised or ratified the act, he may also be personally liable. Um, in contrast, if the employee acted in contravention of orders, the employer may escape liability. Um, that's not always the case. What, considers an, what, what constitutes an order and the quality and content of that order will come under some scrutiny. And I'll consider that further uh, when I talk about how at the moon. Vicarious liability tends to arise when an employee uses an unauthorised mode of carrying out an authorised task of his or her employment. When will an employer not be liable for an act committed by an employee? The courts have generally accepted that an employer will not be liable when an employee is on a frolic of his own. There's a very old case of Joel and Morrison which considered the negligent operation of a horse and cart by a servant. The court accepted that if the servant was without being at all on his master's business and instead was on a frolic of his own, the master could not be held accountable vicariously. Lepore and New South Wales is uh, the High Court decision 
on vicarious liability. Um, it's a fairly unsavory set of uh, facts. Um, it considered the liability of state schools for sexual assault perpetrated by teachers. It's an unsatisfactory decision in many respects um, because the, there emerges no common theme and no authoritative answer for vicarious liability and no indication of future direction. Uh, it's probably further complicated by the fact that the High Court bench is now very differently constituted. It is useful to look at what the different judges said because uh, their judgments emerge in uh, other cases of superior courts in New South Wales and Queensland. Five judges in that matter um, basically remitted the matter back to the lower court to determine whether the acts occurred in the course of employment. Four judges doubted whether a criminal act could even fall within the scope of employment. And in that regard, Justice Callanan said that deliberate conduct lies outside and indeed will usually lie far outside the scope of an employed teacher's duties. On the other end of the spectrum, Kirby was persuaded by the Canadian idea that an employer should always be vicariously liable for all the risks that flowed from its business, whether they were at fault or not. And that's the old benefit and burden dichotomy. Chief Justice Gleeson found that there will be vicarious liability for conduct if there is a close enough connection with the particular responsibilities of the employer. And Justices Gamal and Hain said that the conduct must be done in the intended pursuit of the employer's interests or in the pursuit of the employer's business or apparent execution of the employer's authority. So there are a lot of principles to come from that particular decision. We do see a lot of case law in the area of liability of employers for the illegal conduct of their employees. That is perhaps not surprising because most employers are up in arms about um, the notion that they should be found liable for the deliberate illegal conduct of their workers. Um, I've taken the time to go through a few cases just to give you an idea of the way the courts approach uh, the situation of illegal conduct. Um, in the case of fraud, uh, there's a decision of French and Sistelli in which an employer was found vicariously liable for an employee who stole money from a disabled client she was employed to care for. At first instance, the plaintiff, who was the disabled client, failed because the court accepted that the employee was on a frolic of her own. However, in the appeal decision, the higher court relied on the judgments in Lepore and found that the fact that the employee had intentionally engaged in criminal conduct did not suffice to, to, to deny vicarious liability, nor did the fact that the conduct was contrary to instructions. Just to make things more difficult, um, I'm going to give you two examples of uh, cases about theft which shows you just how fine the line is between when an employer will be found liable and when they will escape liability. In the first case of RF Brown, Steve Dawes stole cargo which they were specifically employed to handle. The ship owners were held liable to the cargo owners because the Steve Dawes were doing that which they were employed to do. They were just doing it dishonestly by siphoning off the top. You can compare that decision to Leash River Tea. Again, it involved Steve Dawes, who were employed to discharge a cargo. Instead of stealing the cargo, they stole the cover plate of a storm valve on the ship. During a subsequent voyage, which was carrying unrelated cargo, a storm caused damage to that cargo because the storm valve was missing. In that case, the Steve Dawes employer escaped liability because the theft of the cover plate was outside the scope of work of discharging the previous cargo. So it's a fine line, but the courts will really closely examine that sufficient connection with the employment. Assault is probably the area which causes the most contention. Why should an employer be liable for an assault committed by an employee? 
again, there's a lot of case law in this area, which reflects uh, the employer's resistance to being found liable um, for such acts committed by their workers. In Zoron Enterprises and Zabao, an employer was found liable for the unauthorised acts of security officers in their employee who assaulted the plaintiff um, when removing him from a hotel. In that case, the court held that whilst the assault was an improper mode of carrying out the employment, it was still a mode of exercising authority in their course of employment as a security guard. In sprawled and public relations oriented security, there's even a more tenuous connection between the employment and the assault perpetrated by the security guards. In that case, the security guards worked for a nightclub. They had a standing arrangement with a nearby pizza shop to provide security assistance in exchange for discounts. The pizza shop called them for assistance because the plaintiff was making a nuisance of himself. The security officers took the plaintiff to a nearby alley and, as they later told the pizza shop attendants, kicked his head in. At first instance, the trial judge relied on the High Court decision in Deaton's and Flu and accepted that the acts of the security guards were not performed under the express or implied authority of the employer. Keep in mind that they're performing these acts in an alley next to a pizza shop so not anywhere in connection with the nightclub where they were employed. The trial judge referred to Justice Gleeson in Lepore, who said that when violence are concerned, then seriousness may be relevant to judgment as to whether it is to be regarded as a personal, independent act of the perpetrator or within the scope of employment, and that extremely and unnecessary violence may indicate pure vindictiveness. On appeal, Justice Ip, who many will know as a leading reformist, um, gave the judgment and found that the employer was vicariously liable uh, for a number of discrete reasons. Uh, basically, he found that the two guards who perpetrated the assault in the alley acted in concert with two other guards who kept watch. And he said that this indicated a planned and deliberate course of conduct and not a spontaneous act triggered by personal animosity and pure personal vindictiveness. He found it was not a gratuitous unplanned act, but had a great deal to do with the performance of the guard's usual duties. I'm sure some employers would found, find that a rather sensational decision. Here's some good news, a case where an employer was not found liable, um, Sarah and Coran Cove. It's a Queensland Supreme Court decision. In this case, one electrician employed by the employer took a wooden bat to his fellow electrician and struck him more than 60 times. In that case, it was found that whilst the plaintiff and his co-worker had a long and difficult working relationship, there was no evidence that the employer's failure to investigate, reprimand, discipline, or more effectively counsel the assailant would have prevented the incident from occurring. It's a fairly common sense approach, I'm sure you would agree. The Supreme Court in that case focused on the knowledge or suspicion of the assailant's propensity for violence by examining a number of pre-assault assault incidents. So in that case, it was relevant that the employer had no knowledge of the propensity for violence. There's a, a, another decision coming out of the Victorian Supreme Court of Appeal. In, in that case, uh, one employed truck driver assaulted another on a prank. Um, the truck drivers were delayed about 18 hours due to a late refueling truck, so they were bored. The plaintiff sued his employer, alleging that his co-worker's assault was motivated by extreme boredom and that the employer should have taken steps to prevent that state from arising. Uh, it's a very good judgment to read in terms of summarising the relevant principles, but the Victorian Court of Appeal held that the employer could, not, could, could only be found liable if the actions by the perpetrator were expressly or impliedly authorised, done in furtherance of the employer's interests, 
or so closely connected with the duties and responsibilities of an employee as to be regarded within the scope of employment. And it found that the actions of the perpetrator did not fall within any of those tests and that his state of mind or his boredom was completely irrelevant. Uh, Howl at the Moon is an interesting decision, uh, a recent emanation from the Queensland Court of Appeal. Um, for those of you who don't know, Howl at the Moon is a nightclub at Broad Beach, which is still advertised as the place where you can have the most fun with your clothes on. In this particular um, incident, a glassy employed by the nightclub inflicted catastrophic injuries on the plaintiff who was outside the nightclub at the time. The particular facts were that the glassy saw a fracas going on in the mall outside the nightclub. The manager of the nightclub was receiving a pummeling from disgruntled patrons who had been earlier ejected. There were no security guards present and just to add another little twist to the facts, the manager was the glassy's uncle. The glassy seeking to assist entered the fray in the mall and struck the plaintiff in the head with the metal pole belonging to a long-handled dustpan. Unfortunately, the plaintiff was just an innocent bystander and had nothing to do with the fray. Could the assault by the glassy be legally characterised as having been done in the course of his employment? Uh, relevantly, the glassy was employed to collect glasses, clean tables and various other incidental activities. He was specifically instructed to leave security issues to security staff. So there's a specific instruction to him. However, Justice Muir did not accept that such an instruction covered all possible contingencies, and in particular those in which the security staff were not present or were otherwise unable to act in time to respond to an emergency. He said that the evidence fell short of demonstrating that the glassy had, a bit, had been instructed not to engage in conduct of the nature involved in his attack to, on the bystander. The glassy's assault, although clearly misguided, was in the interests of protecting the manager and therefore in the course of his employment. The court rejected the defendant's argument that there was insufficient connection between the employment duties and the assault in the mall. It found that the attack was not random but was perpetrated by disgruntled patrons in a continuum of an incident that occurred earlier inside the nightclub. Neither the manager nor the glassy were involved in a frolic of their own. The court also looked at the level of violence and found that this was not inconsistent with the glassy's employment and put it down to the product of spontaneous reaction of inexperienced youth. Importantly, the court emphasised that in an emergency, an employee might be impliedly authorised to do an act different in kind from the class of acts which he is expressly authorised or employed to do. So what are some takeaway points from the issues we've discussed today? Whether it's a loss distribution device or a way of ensuring that a commercial enterprise that has the financial benefit of doing business also bears the cost, vicarious liability of employers is the established law in Australia. There must firstly be an employment relationship, which, as per the decision in Hollis and Babu, may be found at common law on the basis of the degree of control exercised over the worker and the ostensible authority or apparent authority with which he acts. The courts, the courts will scrutinise the nature of the employment duties and what, if any, directions were given. And employers may be liable for unauthorised or even illegal acts if committed in the course of furthering the employer's interest and with sufficient connection to employment. If anything, the cases since Lepore have demonstrated that the courts will go to great lengths to find a sufficient connection with employment. And all you have to do in that regard is look at the decision in Sprod, as opposed to finding a frolic. So in, in that event, the employer may be liable for the unauthorised mode of carrying out an authorised act. 
The court may accept that in an emergency or exceptional situation, the employee impliedly has authority to do things which they didn't ordinarily have an express authority to do. And to negate the vicarious liability, the connection with the employment must be lacking, as it was in that truck driver decision. Thank you very much for that, Brooke. <clears throat> now what we're going to do is ask a polling question. What I'll get uh, Brooke to do is just discuss the situation and then we'll put the question up for everyone to answer. All right, um, let's just assume in a fictitious scenario that an employer employs a carpenter on a multi-storey construction site. Clearly the employer will be vicariously liable if, for example, the carpenter negligently places a hammer down on his scaffold rather than securing it safely in his tool belt and later, having forgotten where he put it, kicks the hammer off the scaffold, causing it to strike his co-worker below in the head. Let's just assume a different factual scenario. Will the employer be liable if the carpenter instead takes his hammer and deliberately strikes his co-worker in the back of the head? Let's just assume that the carpenter is the supervisor and delivers the blow in the course of providing feedback to his co-worker. The carpenter and the co-worker have a long and difficult working history and this is the first physically violent exchange between the pair. Is the, employ is the employer liable? Yes or no? Thank you Brooke. So please answer your question throughout the rest of the presentation and we'll address this towards the end. If you have any questions on Brooke's presentation, please do continue to put them through. We will address these at the end of the presentation as well. I would now like to introduce Hannah to present part two. Thanks Michael. My name is Hannah Staunton and I'm a solicitor at Hopwood Genham. I'll be taking you through part two of today's webinar. The topics I will cover include information gathering immediately following a work incident, statement taking, the involvement of Workplace Health and Safety Queensland, red flags for potential common law claims, and disclosure obligations in the event a claim goes common law. First, let's discuss information gathering immediately following a work incident. The immediate priority in the aftermath after an incident at work is to attend to the injured, isolate the incident, and minimise the risks to the health and safety of all other workers in the area. Once this has been attended to, it is time to start investigating the incident. Slap on that investigation hat. Investigation primarily involves information gathering. The information you gather following an incident will not only be of assistance to your own business and to Workplace Health and Safety Queensland, but it will also assist Work Cover Queensland both at the statutory and common law claim levels. Let's run through a quick checklist of the type of information and documents you should attempt to collate following a work incident. We will address witness statements next as a separate topic. Information and documents to be collected should include incident reports, photographs of the incident area, photographs of the equipment involved, and even photographs of the injured person, diagrams or sketches of the incident location, measurements, contact, contact details of all witnesses, documents relevant to the work tasks being performed at the time of the incident, for example, risk assessments, hazard registers, safe work method statements, job safety analysis, even agenda items for toolbox talks and or minutes from toolbox talk meetings. Also, if machinery or plant has been involved, uh, you also need to gather maintenance records and pre-start checks. Other relevant documentation could include contracts or scope of work documents, training records for all persons involved in the incident, and even documents or information about previous similar incidents. 
The next topic we'll discuss is statement taking. Obtaining statements from witnesses is a vital step when investigating a workplace incident. A statement should be taken as early as possible after an incident occurs, so the details of the incident are still obviously fresh in the witness's mind. A witness's version of events may change over time if you leave it too long to obtain a statement from him or her. A statement should be written in first person. A statement should be taken in chronological order. A statement should also contain facts and avoid opinions. Now there's some common examples of uh, where a witness statement um, could give an opinion and that opinion could be on things like what they think the incident occurred, sorry, why they think the incident occurred, what they think the employer did right or wrong, and what they think the employer could have done better. Obviously, if a statement contains opinions and not just facts, the statement can be damaging to the employer in a workplace health and safety prosecution case or even in a work cover common law claim. Now, how do you ensure your statement contains only facts and not opinions, I hear you ask? Well, our recommendations to you are to use open-ended questions initially to encourage the witness to say what's on their mind. Deal with the who, what, where, when, why and how of an incident. Common examples of questions to ask include what did you see? Who else was there? When did it happen? Then it's time to use closed questions after the witness has told you their story. Examples here would be, was Joe Bloggs carrying a box when you saw him walk down the stairs? Had you seen Joe Bloggs walk down the stairs earlier that day? Once a statement has been given by a witness, please ensure that the witness signs a statement to verify that is an accurate representation of their account of events. After all, the witness statements is theirs, not yours. Just one other point, sometimes it is also worth obtaining statements from other workers who didn't actually witness the specific incident but can shed light on the situation. For example, a process worker severely cuts his finger on a cutting machine working in a factory. You identify that the guard of the blade on the machine was broken at the time of the incident. Not only would you want to obtain a statement from any witnesses who saw the incident, but you should also consider obtaining statements from possibly the worker's supervisor, the person who trained the injured worker, other workers who use the cutting machine and or work alongside the injured worker, and also the person who is responsible for the maintenance of the machine. The next topic to cover is the involvement of Workplace Health and Safety Queensland following an incident at work. An injuries claim to work cover Queensland is not the same as notifying Workplace Health and Safety Queensland that a work incident has occurred. Work Cover Queensland has a different role to play from Workplace Health and Safety Queensland following an incident. Workplace Health and Safety Queensland investigates the cause of the incident, while Work Cover Queensland provides financial compensation to people injured in the course of their employment. No doubt a question on the employee's mind is whether or not they are required to notify Workplace Health and Safety Queensland of an incident. The answer to this question is found in Part 3 of the Work Health and Safety Act 2011. Section 35 of the Act start, states that an incident is notifiable if it arises out of the conduct of a business or undertaking and results in the death, serious injury or serious illness of a person or involves a dangerous incident. The key words in this definition are serious injury or serious illness and dangerous incident. If you move on to the next section of the Act, section 36, it details what is a serious injury or illness. Examples given include where a person requires immediate treatment as an inpatient in a hospital, where a person requires immediate treatment for the amputation of any part of his or her body, where a person requires immediate treatment for a serious head injury, 
where a person requires immediate treatment for a serious burn. Section 37 of the Act then details what is a dangerous incident. Examples given include an uncontrolled escape, spillage or leakage of a sus substance, an uncontrolled implosion or explosion or fire, the fall or release from a height of any plant, substance or thing, the collapse, overturning, failure or malfunction or damage to any plant. Now section 38 of the Act stipulates how Workplace Health and Safety Queensland must be given notice of an incident. Notice must be given by telephone or in writing, whatever the fastest possible means is. Obviously, hopefully it will be by telephone. Make sure you always retain a copy of the notification sent to Workplace Health and Safety Queensland as well as proof that you sent it. Now the next topic we will cover is red flags for potential common law claims. Over the years, WorkCover Queensland and its legal panel have become quite switched on to the fact that there are certain red flags that arise during a statutory compensation claim that ultimately indicate that a worker is or may be planning to proceed with a common law claim. We just wanted to run you through some common red flags so they can uh, be fresh in your mind. Uh, red flags that we know about include where the worker has been seriously injured and his or her functional capacity to work has been seriously compromised. The worker openly states that he or she is going to sue the employer. There is a breakdown in the relationship between the employer and the worker. The worker is disengaged in the return to work process. There is an inability or lack of desire by the employer to redeploy the worker into an alternative role. Now, if you believe or have a suspicion that a worker may proceed with him, our top tips to you as the employers are to do everything reasonably possible to get the worker back to work even if it is in an alternate position and document all attempts made. Also, collate all the information we discussed in relation to information gathering after a workplace incident. Work Covers Legal Panel will want to see all this information to assist with their investigations into the claim. Now the last exciting topic to discuss is disclosure obligations in the event that a claim goes common law. In a common law claim, parties are required to give each other information and documents to assist with investigating the claim. This is what we refer to as disclosure. The disclosure requirements of parties involved in a claim are outlined in section 279 of the Workers' Compensation and Rehabilitation Act of 2003. I'll just quickly run you through that section. The section states, that parties must give each other copies of relevant documents about the circumstances of the event, the worker's injury, the worker's prospects of rehabilitation, the nature of the injury and or any impairment or financial loss resulting from that injury, the medical treatment and rehabilitation the worker has sought was being provided with, the worker's medical history as far as it is relevant to the claim. Now the word or the phrase relevant documents has been floating around and the Workers Compensation Act uh, defines this to mean reports and any other documentary material including written statements made by the worker, the worker's employer, a contributor or by witnesses. So all in all basically the majority of information documents discussed and at the first topic in relation to information gathering following an incident are considered to be relevant documents that must be disclosed in a common law claim. Now Work Cover Queensland as a model litigant has an obligation to ensure appropriate disclosure occurs in a timely manner by all parties. Work Cover cannot do this however without the assistance of the employers. It actually states at section 280 of the Workers' Compensation Act that an employer must cooperate fully and give work cover 
all information and access to documents in relation to the worker that work cover reasonably requires. Now, if you are wondering what sort of information and documents work cover is going to want to see, we suggest that you look at work cover's common law disclosure policy, which is available on its web website. It explains how work cover applies and expects disclosure obligations to be undertaken. It can be found under the forms and resources section on its website. As you would no doubt be aware, however, not all documents are required to be disclosed to the other parties involved in a claim. Now, the relevant section for this is section 284 of the Workers' Compensation Act. It clearly states that a party is not obliged to disclose information or a document if the information or document is protected by legal professional privilege unless the document or information is an investigation report, medical report or report relevant to the injured worker's rehabilitation. This is all a bit confusing, I know, it's even confusing for us lawyers. Basically, the section means that all documents and information must be disclosed except for legal advice and legal communications between a lawyer and client or a client's agent. The other type of document or information that does not need to be disclosed to the parties is information or documents pertaining to a reasonable suspicion that the injured worker is or may be defrauding or attempting to defraud Work Cover Queensland. An example of such information may be surveillance footage. This information is not to be disclosed to the parties, but instead is to be provided to the regulator if there is a reasonable suspicion of fraud. If you believe a document may be protected by legal professional privilege, our best advice to you today is to contact the legal firm that has been appointed by WordCover to act in the common law claim and ask them whether the document or information is protected or whether it needs to be disclosed. Uh, that's at the end of part two. I will now hand you back to Brooke to discuss the answer to the polling question which you have hopefully all answered. So the results are apparently in. And you all think that the employer will be found liable. Appears that the results are 72 in favour of the employer being found liable and 28 opposed. I'll just share my thoughts with you on that. Firstly, as I've tried to address, vicarious liability, while very much part of the common law of Australia, is an evolving area of the law. When we looked at that decision of Sarah and uh, Coran Cove, um, the employer in that case was not found viable and the Supreme Court was able to distill some principles about the relevant knowledge of the employer of the workers' propensity for violence. I think there is some prospect of the same result um, occurring here and the employer possibly uh, escaping liability for this particular incident. Um, having said that, because there have been a number of very conflicting decisions, there's some risk of a sympathetic court accepting that the blow, because it was provided in the course of giving feedback, um, might be an unauthorised mode of supervising the co-worker. And in that regard, I would say that perhaps the plaintiff has a better case than in Cora and Cove. <coughs> Thank you, Brooke. Now what we're going to do is go through uh, just a couple of questions. And Brooke, I'm going to put you on the spot again. The first question we have today, what things can employers do to avoid vicarious liability? Well, that's a very interesting question, Michael. Um, it is a difficult area and um, perhaps, again, it's the, the most often asked question that we get from employers. The issue is that vicarious liability is strict liability. 
So it is liability of the employer for the wrongdoing of its workers imposed by the courts. It's a policy or a principle um, which, as I discussed before, the courts have called it a device for fixing liability on the solvent or the financially cashed up defendant who is unfortunately um, usually the employer with the insurer. So in terms of in a standard type scenario, um, and I'm taking it outside the scope of, of illegal acts or acts that might be considered a frolic, um, if you have a worker who does the wrong thing, and let's take you back to that example of your worker on the metal press who takes off the guard. You've done everything right. You've given him every opportunity to, to, to know how to do his job correctly. And he willfully takes the guard off the machine and injures his co-worker. The employer is liable by virtue of the device of vicarious liability.